By now you should understand that light moves at different speeds depending on the material it's traveling in. And you should sort of understand some of the reasons for why that is now. The effect that this has is when light enters a medium with a different speed, it bends, and we call that refraction. Uh, this happens like, you know, when you see, you put the pencil in water and it looks bent, or glasses, that's how glasses work. Um, any sort of lens, really, that's, that's how they work. They refract the light. So going over here very quickly, uh, we have a table of all the different speeds of light in different materials. So that's the values that are over here, right? So in a vacuum, we know it's about 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Um, and you can see it's slower in different things. Air is very close, right? Uh, it's very close to the, the speed of light in a vacuum because there's not much for the... Uh, there's not many electrons for the, um, the light to interact with. Um, whereas something down here, like benzene, right? That's about 2 uh, times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So... So light travels about uh, two-thirds of the speed of light here. Um, this one, too, is sort of interesting, zircon. You might have heard of cubic zirconium, which is a thing that sort of crystals are made of sometimes that are put in jewelry. Um, and diamond as well, right, is also put in jewelry. And you notice that those have very, very slow speeds um, of light. And one of the reasons why is because the slower the speed of light, or the, the bigger difference in speed of light from a speed in a vacuum or in air, the more that light bends. So the bending of light is what makes sort of diamonds and cubic zirconium sort of sparkle with those light because the light is sort of bent all around the inside and that's why it works. So you might notice here, there's also a column for the index of refraction. And what does the index of refraction mean? Well, it's basically the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light through that material. So we can call the index of refraction N and what basically n is equal to, it's the, so I'll, I'll just put that up here. So basically this column is n. The index of refraction is basically equal to c, right, which is this speed of light in a vacuum over the speed in that material, whatever material it is, right? So that's why it makes sense that in a vacuum it's 1, right, because if you do c divided by c, it would just be 1. And over here, if you use zircon, right, which is about 1.5, 1 1.6 times 10 to the 8, it's about half of the speed of light. So it's like you're doing 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 1.5 times 10 to the 8, which comes out to approximately 2, right? So zircon is about half the speed. So basically, the bigger the number the index of refraction is, the more it slows down. Light slows down going through that material, okay? And it does, as we, as we just talked about, it does refer to basically how much the light is bent in that material as well when it transfers between two materials with different uh, index of refraction. So when we have a problem like this, where we have light coming in from air to a slower medium, like air into water, for example, how is that light going to bend? We know it's going to bend because there's a different speed, right? How is it going to bend? Is it going to bend here? Let me let me change the color to red to sort of represent like a laser, right? If it's coming in like this, is it going to, it's not going to go straight through. We know that, right? Because it has a different speed. Light has a different speed. So is it going to bend sort of outwards like this? Is it going to bend sort of inwards like this? Which one is it going to do? Well, one way to start thinking about this problem, let me just erase those lines. One way to start thinking about this problem is think about waves as like, the light waves as like a, a beam of peaks and troughs, right? So what I'm drawing here is all the peaks. Actually, I'm going to extend it just so it's a little bit easier to see. Like this. So these represent the peaks of the wave and the troughs would be in between. I'm not going to draw the troughs. But you can see we have these points where like the peaks meet up, right? With that second medium, right? And the question is, how is that going to change when it enters that second medium? Because if, so basically as it enters the medium, the peaks have still got to be peaks and the troughs have still got to be troughs. It's not a, like all of a sudden entering a medium, a peak's going peak's gonna to instantly become a trough. We've still got to stay the same. So the question is, if there's still got to be a peak sort of at each of these points, how can we sort of draw the wave that as it continues? Well, there's two ways to do it, right? We could either do it like sort of like this. See how this is bent? 
right? So we've bent the wave. So now the wave is sort of like going in this direction if we look at the perpendicular distance, right? And if you look at it this way, it looks like those waves have sort of spread out. But there's another way to do it. If it bends the other way, right? So instead of those waves sort of spreading out, what if it bends like this, right? Where now this wave sort of, it bends, this, this line sort of, it bends in more towards the middle, right? Now you can see that these wavelengths are closer together. I didn't draw perfectly, but basically those wavelengths are closer together. So which one makes more sense when light enters another medium? Does it make sense that the sort of the wavelengths will spread out or does it make sense they'll get closer together? Well, think about it. If it slowed down, right? Doesn't it make sense? Like the frequency's got to stay the same, right? Because it's still red light. Like if we shine a, a red laser through through um another material, it still stays as a red laser. It doesn't change color, right? So the frequency's got to basically stay the same. If the frequency stays the same, um, it's basically reaching those peaks in the same amount of time. But we know the light has slowed down. So basically, it means that the wavelengths have to get closer together in a slower medium, right? Because basically light is traveling slower. So each time it gets to the peak, it's going to take longer if they're further apart. So it's got to be closer together. So this is basically what happens, right? The, the light bends in a way that makes sure that the peaks get closer together. And what this looks like, I'm going to erase all this. I'm going to erase all this stuff here. Actually, I'm just going to erase everything. Start from scratch. Hopefully, you didn't copy that down. It gets a bit messy. Um, right? The wave comes in. And what it's going to look like, sort of just looking at it as one ray, which is off, obviously a little bit easier to do, is that the light is going to bend towards what's called the normal. And the normal is this like vertical line, the per sorry, perpendicular line to the medium. So do you see how the angle here, theta one, which I've called theta one, is like a, it's a, you know, it's 20 degrees or so. It's, it looks like a large angle. The angle here on the other side, the refracted angle, which we'll call theta two, is much smaller. So it's bent towards the normal. And that's what's going to happen when light enters a slower medium. The light bends towards the normal, aka the, the angle gets smaller. Right, so the refracted angle is smaller. And the relationship, you can actually come up with this relationship yourself. Just like I showed, if you if you actually sketch out those those wave peaks and do a little bit of geometry with a few triangles, you can actually come up with this relationship yourself. It's actually not that bad at all. It's just looking at two right angle triangles, but we'll save that for another time. So basically, this relationship says if we take the index of refraction of the first material, in this case air. Um, and we multiply by the sine of the angle one. So again, it's the angle between the normal and the incident ray. And then we do the same thing th to, to the, um, the index of refraction of the slower medium or the second medium and the angle. Those two things equal each other. It's basically a ratio that, that equals each other. So if we had to find, if we actually read the question now, um, where it says sketch the refracted ray, um, select the material and calculate the refracted angle. So in this case, we know the what we're given is that this is the theta one. It's given right in the question, right? And we have air. So what is our n one? This is going to be our n one because this is air. Well, if we go over to our table, right? Air has an index of refraction of one point zero 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 three. Now you'll notice that's five significant digits. That's a little bit overkill. So most of the time when we say air, we can just say one. And if you want to do three significant digits, we can just say it's 1.00. Let's keep it simple. It doesn't actually give us a material for the slower medium. So let's just pick one. Let's pick sort of the most common one that we often see, water, right? So this has an index of refraction of 1.33, right? So light's basically slowed down by a factor of 30% when it enters water. So N2, so let's just call this water N2. 2 is going to be 1.33, right? So we now have n1, we have theta1, we have n2. So we have three of these four unknowns in this variable, so we can easily just find what that refracted angle is, right? So if we just plug everything in, n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2, 
Again, this is a good point for you to pause the video and try it yourself if you want. I will go through the algebra, but you can try it, try it yourself if you want. So in this case, n1 is 1 sine 20 degrees equals 1.33 sine theta 2, right? So to solve this equation, if you're a bit rusty, um, we want to isolate the theta 2, right? So the first step to do is just divide both sides by 1.33, right? So sort of this will cancel out and we'll get that sine theta 2 is equal to whatever 1 times sine 20 divided by 1.33 is, which should come out to 0 0.2572 rounded to four significant digits. So that's what the sine of theta 2 is. So in order to find theta 2, what the actual angle is, we need to use inverse sine, right? So I'm going to do sine negative 1 to this side and sine negative 1, sine inverse to this side. And that's going to cancel out. The signs are going to cancel out here. And you're left with the angle, which if we do the calculation, switch back to red, is theta 2 equals 14.9. That's to three significant digits, degrees, right? So does it make sense that this angle is smaller than the 20 degrees where it's coming in? Yeah, right? Because it's entering a slower medium. So the angle, it, it bends, the light ray bends towards the normal, right? So the light ray bends towards the normal, so the angle should be smaller. So here's a second question where we have air that's from a slower medium is going to go to a faster medium air, right? Um, so we can pick anyone. I'm just gonna let's just pick randomly. Let's pick quartz crystal Okay, so it's like a clearish crystal sometimes a little bit pink quartz crystal um, the index refraction is 1.46 So n1 equals 1.46 and n2 in this case is 1 right because it's air 1.00 So what I want you to do is I want you to try solving this problem see what the angle so in this case, by the way, the incidence angle is 30 degrees, right? It says in the question. So can you find the angle? Can you sketch it, what it's going to look like when air enters a faster medium? Sorry, when light enters a faster medium. So pause the video here, try it yourself, and unpause when you have an answer because I will reveal. So what I get is 46.9 degrees. So you'll notice that's bigger than the 30 degrees. Does that make sense? Well, unlike the previous question, where when we were entering a slower medium, light bends towards the medium, when you enter a faster medium, this is where the light, sort of the wavelengths are gonna spread out, right? Because they're moving faster. So the time between peaks is gonna be basically a further distance or the distance between peaks is gonna be further. So it's gonna spread out. So it's gonna move away from the normal. So it's gonna bend sort of in this direction. And this angle here, your uh, refracted angle, 46.9, is a little bit larger than the incidence angle. All right, so that should make sense. So again, just to summarize, if, you, if light is entering a slower medium, it will bend towards the normal. And if it's entering a faster medium, it will bend away from the normal. All right. Now, last question. Calculate the maximum incidence angle that refraction will occur for in problems one and two. So what do we mean by ref maximum incidence angle? So if we think about it, what's gonna happen if we change this 30 degrees, right? Let me choose a different color. Let me just choose green for the sake of keeping it looking different, right? So if we, first of all, if we change this angle here, right? What's gonna happen? Well, it's still gonna bend away from the the light's still going to bend away from the normal, but it's going to be less of an angle, right? And if I bend it here, if I do it here, it's going to be less of an angle. And in fact, if I do it straight through, it's not going to bend at all. And mathematically, maybe if you look at the equation, you maybe can see why that is. Well, think about what the angle between the normal and the incidence ray is. It's going to be zero, right? So you can look at the calculations and why that is, why it just goes right through. So basically, the refraction only happens if you shine the light on an angle to the normal. Now, if we keep going the other way, 
right? So I'll use a different color here. Let me use yellow. If we go the other way, so if I make this line go here, right? What's gonna happen? Well, it's gonna be bent even more, right? And if I go even more like this, the light's gonna be bent even more. What do you notice? There's gonna be some angle where the angle of refraction is gonna be basically 90 degrees to that normal, right? So it's gonna sort of go right along the surface. And in fact, if I go more than that, no light is going to be refracted at all. Basically the light's gonna all bounce off and you get a reflected ray. You always get a reflected ray in all of these cases, but that's not sort of the focus of what's going on. The point is, if you have like, if you're past this critical angle, you're not gonna get any refracted light. So in this case, in the case of the example I just drew, the refracted angle was, the, or the, the angle that basically caused it to go 90 degrees was this one, right? So this angle between the normal and that is called, and, and that angle is called the critical angle, right? So you'll notice something very specific about the critical angle, right? The angle of incidence is what it is. It's whatever this angle is between the normal and the incidence ray. But what's the angle of refraction? So the angle that this line makes with the normal? Well, you'll notice it's 90 degrees, right? So if we know that the at the critical angle, theta 2 is going to be 90 degrees, we can just use that in our equation to find out what theta 1 is, right? So we can work backwards this time. And theta 1, when theta 2 is 90 degrees, is our critical angle. So if we just use the same example, example 2, right? Um, let's set it up. So this is for example 2. We'll talk about example 1 in a second, but this is for example 2, right? We have n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. But we now know that theta 2 at the critical angle, so this is going to be the critical angle, theta c, we'll call it theta c for the critical angle, where theta 2 is 90 degrees, right? So that's always true at the critical angle. So in this case, we want to find that critical angle. So if we know n1 again is, what do we say? It's 1.46 and n2 is 1. Let's solve. So 1.46 sine of theta c is equal to n2, which is just 1, sine of 90, right? We should now be able to solve for sine of theta c. Well, what is sine of 90 degrees? If you do it on your calculator, it, sh it should tell you that sine of 90 degrees is just 1. So in other words, our sine of our critical angle, if we just divide both sides by 1.46, divide by 1.46, is just gonna end up being one over 1.46, which comes out to one over 1.46 is 0 0.6849. And again, if we do sine inverse of both sides, our, our critical angle comes out to inverse sine of 6849 is 43.2. I'll just round it to three significant degrees, 43.2 degrees. So basically, what it's telling us is the critical angle for this material, which I believe was quartz, right? The critical angle for quartz is 43.2 degrees. So if our angle between the normal and our incident ray is greater than that, no light is going to be refracted. It's all going to be reflected. And if it's less than that, then there will be some light refracted, right? And we see the original question we were given was when it was 30 degrees, so that's why it was okay. But if we have an angle bigger than that, it's not going to work. Now, if you're interested, you can always try. What happens if you plug in a number bigger than 90 degrees for, or sorry, bigger than 43.2 degrees in for our theta c? What happens to it mathematically? I'll let you have a, have a go at that and see, see what happens. And the second question I'm going to leave you at is, I skipped problem one for this. We didn't calculate the critical angle for problem one. I want to see if you can come up with that. Okay, see if you can find the critical angle for problem one. And then we will discuss when we get a chance.